Hi there, my name is Vic V. I'm an ENT surgeon working for the NHS in central London, and today I want to talk to you about nasopharyngeal stenosis. Just in case you don't know, nasopharyngeal stenosis is when basically the palate gets stuck to the back wall of your throat. So the teeth here, the tongue coming down like that, you've got your tonsils here and here, the dangly thing, and which is the bottom end of the palate, the soft palate is the soft bit that flaps backwards and forwards. And behind all of that is the back wall of your throat. It's when this palate area in the uvula area, the dangly thing here, gets stuck to the back wall of your throat. So, um, so say if this is the palate and it's meant to be off the back wall of your throat like this and flaps backwards and forwards if you're snoring, it can get stuck here, except for a little bit uh, where the uvula is and the air just about gets through that little hole there. Now the problem is people just feel dreadful with this thing. Uh, they don't feel like they can ventilate their nasal cavity at all, so they feel very congested, hot and stuffy in their nose. They uh, can't get air through their nose, so what happens is that their voice changes quite a lot, and you don't get the resonance that people get with air passing through their nose. And it's very hard to eat because they, you can't breathe through your nose at the same time. So it's it's not great. It's a terrible situation. People go very hard to get rid of this problem. Now, I think the worst thing about this condition is nearly always caused by surgeons who are causing damage to the palate and it gets stuck to the back wall of your throat uh, by what's known as an adhesion. It sort of gets stuck there, a bit like glue. The most common way of this happening is that when that people laser through the palate and accidentally laser right through the palate into the back wall. So the two ends are both inflamed red and raw and have got raw areas there. And when that happens, particularly if the palate is um, sitting on that back wall, they get stuck together to raw areas of tissue. The body just assumes that they're meant to be touching each other and then they heal together. Now, I know that a lot of people around the country have now started doing sleep surgery, which is great. If you're going to start doing sleep surgery, please be careful of this problem. Uh, so this is the reason I never use uh, CO2 lasers for anything. In, um, well, once every so often I do, but for a different reason altogether. If you're not very careful, you have to make sure firstly that you've got protection between the palate and the back wall of your throat. So you should put, I'm gonna put my wallet in the way, uh, you put your um, a bit of tissue or gauze there. So when you're lasering through the palate, if that's what you really want to do, it doesn't go through into the back wall of your throat. And the other thing you should make sure is that you have to make sure that the palate is not resting on the back wall of your throat. Uh, that, that seems a bit weird, but let me explain that. If you look into a child's mouth or, or anyone's mouth who isn't a snorer, if you look in their mouth like this, you'll see the tongue going down like that, you'll see maybe tonsils left and right and the uvula there, and you'll see a big space between the uvula and the palate, the soft bit there, and the back wall of your throat. You'll see a palpable distance, what we would call the retropalatal distance. And those people don't snore, don't have sleep apnea. Whereas if you look at someone who does snore very, very loudly and you look carefully at it, you'll see that the palate and uvula area is quite congested and swollen and sort of boggy, and it's slap bang and sitting on the back wall of your throat nearly all the time. Um, and it, it seems very obvious when you look at people, you go, oh, there's a problem here. This looks very different to someone else altogether. But what you don't want to do is, even if you've put a bit of protection here, not by a wallet, but a bit of tissue, and you've laid it through, you don't want it to later just stay sitting there and therefore reconnect again. Because the way adhesions form is when, when this thing is healing up, is desperate for some oxygen, desperate for a blood supply for somewhere to give it some oxygen so it can heal quicker. And if this inflamed bit of raw tissue is sitting on even normal tissue, it'll go, well, this wall has loads of tissue. This, this wall has loads of blood supply, loads of oxygen. I'll attach myself to it so the blood vessels can come through that attachment and feed me oxygen, feed me blood so that I can heal up. I mean, it doesn't think like that, but you understand my meaning. Uh, this same thing, uh, adhesions happen in Crohn's disease and uh, other diseases, infections in the stomach. So um, I'm not going to go into adhesions. That's a long story, but but I hope you understand that's how adhesions form. It You can't just uh, protect the back wall and leave it like that. You actually have to do something about it. You need to bring that palate forward. And I'll quickly just come off topic for a short time. This is the most important part about snoring surgery rather than sleep apnea surgery. Just stiffening up the palate so it doesn't flap around in the wind is important. You don't want it to do that in the low frequency sort of like this. You want it to you want to stiffen it, sure, but you also want to bring it off that back wall so that there is air, a passage of air that can pass into your nose. You don't want it sitting there but stiff. 
it doesn't make any sense it doesn't work. I think I have other videos about this palate operation, how it A, doesn't help sleep apnea, and B, how to do it. You've got to bring your palate forward. And there's lots of techniques, uh, and I can talk about anterior platyplasty one day about that, and uh, which is probably the best operation for simple snoring. But let's skip that for the meantime. Nasopharyngeal stenosis, this is when the palate is stuck here and there's a little bit of air around the back of the uvula and people feel horrible with it. I've worked out my way of fixing this. Um, I never do laser surgery, so I'm often inheriting it for other people. But if there are other surgeons around the world who've got these patients and don't know what to do about it, this is how I fix it. And hopefully you'll find this information useful. So the f first thing to tell patients is that unfortunately this is a two, sometimes three stage operation. And the first stage is quite obviously separating this palate from the posterior wall. So you're cutting through in between the two. And that seems obvious, but the problem is if you just cut it and just said, oh, you should be fine, it won't work. Because within about two or three weeks, the two red raw areas will just reattach again and you'll be back to square one with even more scar tissue and a less sort of functioning palate. So what I've done is that I cut through the adhesions between the soft palate and the posterior wall, and I try and cut more on the the back pharyngeal wall as much as possible rather than the palate because I need that extra bulky tissue there for later. I've got to be careful because this posterior pharyngeal wall is touching, was sitting right on top of the spine, so you can't go too deep. But if you were to choose between the two, I'd stay a millimeter or so on the posterior pharyngeal wall rather than the palate. Try and give yourself as much thickness on the palate as possible because you'll need that in operation two and three. So now that you've got two red raw areas here with a little bit of the tissue come off this way, uh, and a, maybe a slight indentation on here, like I said, about a millimeter deep. What I do is use some silastic sheeting over that red raw area, and I stitch that in over the raw areas on the back wall of your throat. I'll try and draw some pictures as I do this uh, so it makes a bit more sense. So the palate has been taken off this, and on those raw areas here, left and right of the uvula, I stitch in some silastic. I use 0.25 millimeter silastic because 0.5 people really feel and they can't swallow properly. 0.25, it crumples very easily and uh, and it's not so irritating for these patients because that silastic needs to stay there for two or three weeks. Um, I tend to try and avoid any stitching in the midline if at all possible. So it tends to be one, two, three without that one in the middle. And I'll again, I'll draw a picture of the two silastic sheets which I stitch onto the back wall of your throat. As I said, that stays there for about two or three weeks and then you use non-absorbable suture. You don't want it to dissolve because if you can imagine any sort of absorbable suture in your throat will, will decompose very quickly because there's loads of uh, saliva, there's loads of enzymes that break down these things. So non-absorbable, so you have to come back in two or three weeks to cut those things out and remove the silastic carefully without it dropping down into the airway at all. Now at this point, it's all healed up. Uh, the two sides of uh, the raw area have healed up and the patient finally gets to snore again, which sounds dreadful, but um, the ability to snore and breathe again is, you know, people just like, I'd wish I could snore again because it's such an awful feeling having this, having this stenosis. So helping them, giving them the ability to snore again feels great. Uh, anyway, so uh, we've broken it apart. There's, there's now uh, two areas which should not heal together, but they're still stuck to each other. So there is a, not stuck to each other, they're still sitting on top of each other. There is still a chance over the next few months of it slowly sh shrinking down and um, adhesing again. So you have to make sure now that the silastic has been removed in operation two, to try and bring that palate forward. Now, if you're lucky, you've got a big, fat, sort of chunky palate, uh, and you can just do an anterior platyplasty and lift the whole thing forward uh, and stop this from attaching itself back again. You may use the barb suture platyplasty uh, or platypharyngoplasty if need be. And I don't think I've talked about those two operations yet on this channel. I do need to get onto those things. But there are lots of techniques basically to bring the palate forward and maybe hitch it up a little bit to a normal level. What you don't want to do is change the palate at all so that it's in, ab in an abnormal position because sometimes uh, you get side effects of not having a functioning palate. When the point of the palate is when you drink some water or some eat some food, it stops the food from going up into your nose. It lets it go down into your throat. And when you're breathing normally, it comes through your nose. So it's a flap that goes backwards and forwards. You need it to be functional for you to have a normal life. So that's why when it's stuck like that, it's, it's 
people absolutely hate it. They didn't realize how important the palate is once it's done that. Anyway, so um, you use and either an anterior platyplasty if the thickness of the palate is quite thick. Sometimes I worry about that because it's just had an operation and sometimes a barb suture, if that's not going to cause a pinhole or if that's going to cause a fissure, that's okay. And you sort of judge it on its own merits. So just be good at both of those operations before you attempt this operation. And you bring everything forward and up a little bit and then hopefully just let it settle down and that would be the end of it. Sometimes you have to break the, um, the operation two and three apart. So you just take the silastic out and say, come back in a few weeks, let all the inflammation die down a little bit more, then do the operation to pull it forward. And I've taught this to a few different people and their patients are doing well and it works on my patients. And so I think if you don't know what to do with these patients, you should try it. Probably best to get someone to help you through. And, and if you contact me, I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through it again if there are some questions about it. But equally, if there's someone out there who knows or has a different way of dealing with these patients, um, do let me know because I, there's nothing much in the literature. The operations that are out there don't seem to work very well. And I would be interested in collaborating with someone who's had lots of these patients and has known has worked out how to fix them without doing a two, three stage operation. Um, but if you haven't got any um, experience with this and you'd like to try and help your patient sitting in front of you, this works quite well for me and I hope it works well for you. Anyway, thank you very much. Bye-bye.